seven years of hunting. Uh, he still had some issues with his blood pressure, but he had a, an allergic reaction that was quite severe. <coughs> he was in the hospital for several days. But um, um, Sandra and him want you to know they appreciate your prayers and let you know that he is much improved. Um, he still has a little way to go, but uh, we're very thankful that uh, everything was as successful as it was. This morning, as we look at this scripture, I just think this is such an exciting story. Two days after this, this means that two days after Jesus had selected the disciples, Andrew, uh, Nathan, uh, Nathaniel, and, and uh, Peter, and John. Two days after this, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus was invited to the wedding, and so his disciples when the wine had run short, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, uh, Woman, let me handle this in my own way. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. There were six stone water pots standing there. They were needed for the Jewish purification custom, and each of them held about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the very brim. He said to them, Draw from them now and take what you draw to the steward in charge. They did so. When the steward had tasted the water which had become wine, he did not know what it he did not know where it came from. But the servant who had drawn the water knew. The servant called the bridegroom, the steward called the bridegroom, and said to him, Everyone first sets before the guests the good wine, and then, when they have drunk their fill, he sets before them the inferior wine. You have kept the good wines until now. Jesus did the first of his signs in Galilee, in Cana of Galilee, and displayed his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many of you just love a good wedding? Oh, I just love it. Isn't it fun? Yes. The last wedding I went to was Landis and Alyssa's, and it was beautiful. And it was just so much fun. And, and the food was good, and just plenty of everything. And it just made you so happy to see the joy that that couple had. As a minister, I have had many opportunities to officiate at weddings. It's always a little nerve-wracking. Because, you know, the bride is a little anxious. The mother of the bride and the mother of the groom are equally anxious. The groom is usually cool, calm, and collected. He's, he's just there where they tell him to be. And so um, most brides are, are so fearful that something's going to go wrong. They're so fearful that, you know, the cake will slip or um, the flowers won't arrive. Or I was worried maybe the groom wouldn't show up, but that wasn't a problem. But... Uh, you know, we just kind of we want everything to be perfect because it is our special day. And um, Savannah had on the most beautiful white dress, and she looked lovely. And if I had to only describe her in one word on the wedding day, it would be happy. She was so happy. And so was everyone else. And so that's the way weddings are. They are a time for us to celebrate love and joy and happiness. When Michael and Matthew got married, of course, I was the mother of the groom. I've heard it's worse. She could be the mother of the bride. But as you know, the groom's mother is responsible for planning the rehearsal dinner. And so uh, I had a lot of fun planning out what we were going to have at Michael's rehearsal dinner. And uh, Michael's wife, Tanya, has a very large family. So they were all coming to the rehearsal dinner. And so I just wanted to be sure that I had enough food and I had enough of everything. And I had never used this caterer before. And I, I was a little skeptical. <coughs> and uh, I didn't know, you know, if you're planning for Matthew's wives to eat, that is different than planning for a dainty little girl to eat. You know? So it was like, oh my, we're going to have enough, we're going to have enough. And, uh, and so we, did, we ran out of sweet tea. Have you ever been at a southern wedding where they ran out of sweet tea? Oh, it's not good. And so I called, the, the caterer had not stayed with us. 
And so I called her and I said, Brad T, Brad T. And she said, that can't be. I said, yes, it can. And it's not here. And you bring it. <laughs> and I said, the macaroni looks pretty slack, too. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm sure uh, she had uh, dealt with difficult people before, but I'm sure she was talking <coughs> difficult that day. But uh, she brought more tea. And so when Matthew got married, I thought, now I'm just going to relax and enjoy this. And his, um, his fiance or his wife, she wanted the rehearsal dinner at Castle McCullough, which is in Greensboro. And I thought, okay, she's going to be my daughter-in-law. This is what she wants. This is what we'll do. So uh, we carried the catered food from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. But we had, it was really, really nice. And I knew someone that I knew, and, and we had way more food than we needed, but that was okay. We had enough for dinner. So we all understand this scene at this wedding. The wedding takes place in Canaan, and we know that Jesus and his disciples at that time went. So there were five disciples and Jesus, and so there's more people at the wedding. And Jesus, Jesus of course, was invited to the wedding, and we know that he was happy to be there, and he enjoyed the occasion. But when Jesus got there, he got there on the uh, third or fourth day. In Jewish culture, at this time, a wedding took seven days. The first thing that happened was a feast, and after the feast was the wedding ceremony. And then for seven days, um, the bridal couple would move around town or around the village so everybody could congratulate them. Now, they did not go on a honeymoon. They went to the house that they were going to live in and entertain company for seven days. So, uh, uh, when Jesus arrived, they're on the third or fourth day. And um, in that culture at that time, for you to have run out of wine would have been something that you honestly would never get over. People would always remember that when it was your turn um, to be in charge of the celebration that you were not able to fulfill your responsibilities. And it would have been a shame that would have been on that family uh, forever. So here in Cana, a young, <coughs> poor girl is getting married, and Jesus has come to the wedding. And so the first thing that uh, Mary does, the mother of Jesus, the first thing she does when she sees there's a problem, <coughs> which tells us she must have been a relative of the, the wedding couple, or she must have been uh, in some way responsible because she has realized that the, the wine is getting low. And so when Jesus comes, she says to him, you're running out of wine. How did Mary know that Jesus could take care of this? Mary knew that this was the Son of God. She knew that her son could do a miracle that would save this family from great embarrassment throughout their lives. Mary knew that Jesus was the answer to the problem. Are you out of wine? Jesus is the answer to the problem. So Mary trusts Jesus. What she says is, do whatever he tells you to do. She did not know what the solution was. She did not know how he was going to take care of this problem, but she knew that he could handle whatever was at hand. And that's what we do need to remember. No matter what our crisis is, Jesus can handle the situation. And so in the uh, Greek language, as we know, some of the words don't translate as well as maybe they could in English. And so he refers to her as woman. And to us, that sounds like a very negative thing. It sounds like he's not being respectful. But that's not the case at all. Um, a, a better word translation in the Revised Standard Version uses uh, lady, which would be a much more better translation. And we know that that is a term of endearment and a term of respect because when Jesus was on the cross, he said to John, Behold, Mary, this woman will now be your responsibility. And so, um, so Jesus is, is listening to what his mother says. And um, we have learned over the years that if we volunteer our children to do something, that might not be the best thing. Um, 
the boys were teenagers and uh, one of the church members um, was not doing well and they needed their lawn mowed. And so I said to the group of people that were talking about this problem, I said, well, my boys will go over and mow the grass. And they all looked at me, being parents that they were, and they said, you're volunteering them without asking them? And I said, look, the man has two of the prettiest daughters you've ever seen, and they just happen to be their age. I bet they'll go, and they did. So, but we know that we don't always volunteer other people uh, because they need to speak for themselves. But Mary knew Jesus. She <coughs> knew what Jesus was capable of doing. And so Jesus says to the, the servants, fill these water pots full. And um, the Jews were very specific on their ritual. Before they ate, they washed their hands. And after every course, they wash their hands. So they could be washing their hands uh, three or four times while they in the midst of their meal. When they first arrived, uh, the servants would wash their feet. So if the road was dusty, they washed their feet. If the road was muddy, they washed their feet. And so these water pots were empty because they had already been used for those purposes. So Jesus tells the servants, go and fill these to the brim with water. And Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, you do. That's called obedience. And we know that we, to have a successful relationship with our Lord, we have to trust and obey. When we can't see the way out, we know we still trust who's in charge. And so Mary said, just, just do whatever he tells you. A woman of great faith. So Jesus told them what to do. And so he turned the water into wine. He also said to Mary, my time has not yet come. My hour is not here. And when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember him talking about it was the hour. His time had come. And so he was telling Mary that it really wasn't time yet for him to begin his earthly ministry. Did that deter her? No. She went right along with what she uh, needed and what she needed him to do. Trust and grace. Sufficient grace. And so as um, Mary trusted Jesus to take care of the situation, but he had said, my hour has not yet come. And this tells me something very, very important. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. And so, because there was a need, and because the uh, request had been sent, then Jesus, before his hour had come, does his first miracle. Does his first miracle. In other words, his grace was sufficient for the need. If we trust and obey, what joy we will have. It is so exciting to see how God works in our lives when we think that there's no other option or um, there's just no answer to the situation. If we can only trust him, he will see us through. We may not, like Mary, be able to see the end or how it's going to come about, but we know, we know that he is going to be with us and he will lead and guide us and direct us. After Jesus had turned the water into wine, it says that the disciples believed. We believe because we see Jesus work in the lives of others, and we have had Jesus work in our lives. We have experienced his love, his mercy, and his grace. Our closing hymn is 128, and when we get through with the hymn, if you just have a seat, um, uh,